Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this study this morning. Can we um, pray together as we open God's word? Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the things that we see in your word, for the light that is shining upon our path. And, and uh, Lord, in this dark world of sin and suffering, you know the needs that exist, uh, physical needs. Uh, we pray for uh, those that are suffering health problems, in particular the lady that was mentioned uh, this morning. We ask that um, you can help her. And we pray for each person here who is struggling. We know uh, the assaults of the enemy that happen around us, but we know, Lord, also your peace in, in the midst of all these conflicts that we can trust in you and not look at those things that we have no control over. So we leave all things in your hands and to ask that you can, can strengthen us uh, for these trials. We pray that as we uh, continue this study in understanding Judges 15, uh, that we can hear your voice speaking to us, and that you can guide and direct us. And we pray this now and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, we finished off yesterday with, uh, well, something that was bothering me. I actually had to go back uh, into my paper and address this point because I didn't address it, I noticed. So that was partly why it was, was bothering me <laughs> because I was doing in, in the paper that I did, which is now on academia, and, and I can give people a link to that if they want right now. Um, but uh, so this kind of here, I'll put this on here in the chat. Um, no, that's not what I want. Well, I, I think that'll probably give you a link. This is actually in the comments section, but I think it'll probably still link you to the paper. If not, you can just go to academia and find it. Uh, but uh, what I will do is I'll go to this paper here and you put it on an email, email something. Um, yeah, I can put it in an email and send it to everyone. Oh, yeah, that's I like people to go to the academia site to read the paper um, rather than just reading the PDF on, you know, because I like to get lots of hits on there. It makes me feel better about myself. But um, no, it's just, it's interesting to keep track of, of all these things. <laughs> that was funny, Theodore. Okay. I'm glad you thought it was funny, but. Uh, no, no, I, I get what you're talking about though, but um, it, it was it, funny. Yeah, you can keep track of, um, it. just keep track of things. So it's Leviticus 23 verse 21. That's what I want. Is this your latest, your latest posting you're talking about? Yeah, that my latest the wave sheep offering. Yeah, yeah. So, um, like I did send out copies of the word for people that make corrections on it, but uh, people can also mention on the academia site if there's something that's a typo. So, where is this here? Uh, this is the deal uh, part dealing with the self same day. Yeah, here it is. See to Jerusalem. Oh, I see why. In this paper, let's see, I see my academia profile here. Okay, so. <clears throat> so we were discussing Leviticus 23, verse 21. So what I was doing was dealing with the self same day. So the self same day idea. So I'm going to go through this a little bit here. I mean, I could just bring up the paper. So I'm going to go. There we go. So this is the paper. This is my academia site. This section dealing with the self same day. 
Uh, this is the bone day, right? So it's uh, Hebrew bet etzem hayom chazeh, which literally translated would be in the bone, the day this, that's if I put it in that order, or, or in this bone day, which occurs 14 times in the Old Testament. Two other times it occurs with a different prefix. In Ezekiel 24.2, it occurs with uh, et at the beginning, et etzem hayom hazeh with the prefix et making the direct object, marking the direct object translated as this same day. And Ezekiel uh, 24, two also has in that verse, uh, has be et sem heom heze, translated as this same day, thus appearing two times in that verse. Um, in Leviticus 23, 14, uh, as ad et sem heom heze, right? So just these different, different, uh, uh, parts of that is a prefix ad meaning until. So the idea here, you can see this is an old calendar. This was found uh, in Tel Afara. It's about 20 miles from Gaza. And there's three holes in this, this piece of bone. And you would put a bone peg in there. So you would mark off the days of the month. And one thing interesting is you don't, don't see the marking off the days of the week with this. It's just marking off the days of the month. So you, you, that would be an argument against uh, uh, the lunar uh, Sabbath idea, right? Because you know, if, if they were marking off the, the week connected with the month, then it would be uh, pretty simple, right? You would see some kind of calendar that would have a group, you know, four groups of seven with these two extra little holes, uh, you know, for those, those dates. But here you can see they just have the 10... Uh, 10 in each of these rows. And so what would happen is you would go out on, on the 29th, if you if you saw the new moon, well, you'd just move your peg back to space one starting day one. But if you didn't, you would go to pay to, 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 to the 30th hole, and then you wouldn't need to go and look at the moon. You would just start over at day one, right? So kind of interesting that they found this here. And then these are all the verses that have this uh, self same day with this uh, it's him, which is this uh, a bone day. So these are all the bone days. There's 14 of them mentioned in scripture. Now, when I originally had written out my paper, for some reason I missed the one, um, I just didn't write on it. And that was uh, Leviticus 23 verse one on the self same day, which is one, the one we looked at yesterday. So I had to add that to my paper, and I think you know, I uploaded this version. Yeah. So Pentecost, this is the one, I think. Yeah. <clears throat> so while we address Pentecost, in, while we will address Pentecost in more detail later in the paper, we will here address the use of self-same day in connection with it. So I'm going to quote Leviticus 23, verse 15 to 21, which we read yesterday. So, and he, and we ye shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that ye brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. So when they cross in, into the promised land, the first time that they keep this wave sheaf offering, is going to be the morrow after the Sabbath. That is, that's the seventh day Sabbath. And in this paper, I show that that's not, um, you know, referring to a yearly Sabbath, that there's no possible way that you, you can't find any evidence for that. Uh, it's pretty clear that it's the Sabbath, but that's only the first time. And then what's gonna happen is that they're going to have this on the self same day and that self same day would refer to the day of the month. That is, it's the bone day, right? So they never refer to a Sabbath as a bone day, though I put that, you know, maybe that's possible, but it's more consistent to say that um, a, a bone day is referring to a day of a month, an anniversary, not a weekly anniversary, sometimes a monthly anniversary and sometimes a yearly anniversary, but there's no, we can't find anywhere that it's a weekly anniversary. Um, 
because they're not marking the weak with the bone, right? If that makes sense. So it talks about that you're going to count even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, these 50 days, right? So once you get to the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, you get the 50th day. And of course, that's going to be the first day of the week, right? Because if you start um, on the first day of the week and you count seven complete weeks, and then you, the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, that's going to be a weekly Sabbath, then that's going to be the 50th day. Pentecost, the first time that it's observed, is going to be on a Sunday. But it's also going to be on what date on the Jewish calendar? So the first time they keep it, what's the, the biblical date going to be? Or Pentecost? No, no, the first time they keep the wave offering, I'm saying. Well, well, if you were talking about Pentecost, I guess, yeah. But both Pentecost or the wave, wave offering. So Pentecost is, so if we start with the wave offering, it's going to be on what date? Because the Sabbath, remember, they're going to uh, go out to gather uh, the manna on the day after they eat um, uh, the old corn of the land, right? And then they're going to have the next day, they're going to have the wave sheaf offering. And so they're going to keep Passover. So the first time that they observe the wave offering, that's going to be on what date on the biblical calendar? Not on the 16th day. Yeah, so the 16th. Yeah, so the 16th day of the first month. And then, of course, if you count seven weeks, then it's going to be on the sixth day of the third month that you're going to have Pentecost. And, and that's what the Jews do today. They have the sixth day of the third month is Pentecost. But the Karite Jews don't do it that way. They always have Pentecost and the wave sheaf offering on a, on a Sunday right, on the first day of the week. Because they take this and they say, well, since you have to keep it on the morrow after the Sabbath, that you should always do that. But they're just talking about the first time, right? So, um, and then it says, ye shall proclaim on the selfsame day that it may be a holy convocation unto you. So this selfsame day would refer to a day of the month. So they're saying from then on, you're always going to keep Pentecost on the 6th of Sivan, right? It doesn't say that directly, but that's what it's saying. Um, so I, I write here just to explain what I just said. What is the selfsame day referring to in this passage? First, we see that after seven Sabbath shall be complete on to the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, you shall number 50 days, bringing us to Pentecost which in that year would have been the first day of the week. Is the selfsame day referring to the day of the week? Or is this again telling us that this date will be proclaimed on the selfsame day, it being Sivan 6? The latter seems more consistent. The selfsame day seems to be a reference to an anniversary date, as we have noted. While there is a plausible objection that there are no clear calendar dates given for observing either the wave offering or Pentecost, and that we are only given the day of the week, we see in the phrase, on the selfsame day, a valid argument to why this is. And then I say, we're going to address this later. For now, we simply want to point the reader to this detail. So I'm going to address that, obviously, later in the paper, which is one of the main points of this paper. Now, we're studying this because if we go back to Judges chapter 15, and I just think it's interesting how we, we get to this point, sort of at the point that we need to understand it. Um, so in Judges 15, what we were addressing is it came to pass within a while after in the time of wheat harvest. So I'm saying that that phrase, a while, a while after, is actually referring to Pentecost. It is, if we look at the Hebrew, I know you don't read Hebrew here, but, um, you know, so it says, you know, and it was, 
you know, so it was, that's this word, Haya. That's that's actually related to the Yehovah or Yehovah or Yahweh, however you want to say it, the YHWH uh, name of, of God, Jehovah, right? Uh, it actually comes from this word, the, the self-existent one, because this, this word here means to exist, that is to be or come or come to pass, right? And so it came to pass, and then it says, from, that is mim, yom. So from the day, in, that is biyom, biyomi, actually. It's going to have a, 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 another letter, a yod at the end, uh, which, which is tying this together. So they're, they're going to try to translate this in the King James you know, as, but it came to pass within a while after, right? Um, and that's within comes from that bet at the beginning of the word yom. But you can see that this is not is not a literal translation. Now, you know, even if I look at uh, Young's literal translation, it came to pass after some days. Well, you know, that's not really a literal translation either. Right? I mean, he, you know, you know, it was from uh, from from day in day, right, or day in days, however you want to look at that. Um, in the days of wheat harvest. Now, see, they're going to put this days here. So let me see here. So when when they look at this, um, so. So they're trying to translate. Here we have this word uh, wheat uh, harvest or the harvest of wheat, right? So you got chata, that's wheat, and you got uh, katasir, which is harvest. Katsir, how do you say that? That's katsir. Okay. And, and so then they try to put this in the days of wheat harvest. So they're trying to add this to here. But if you look at this, from the days to the day of wheat harvest, right? So the wheat harvest starts on Pentecost, correct? Correct. So this is telling us that this is these days here are the counting of the 50 days, the counting of Pentecost. Is that is that clear to people? That that's what it's telling you? That this clearer. Okay, so this is just a way of telling you that this is the time of wheat harvest after this counting of the days, right? And the counting of the days would have to be these 50 days counting to wheat harvest because wheat harvest starts on Pentecost. So this was not something that I, that I knew two days ago. I only knew this yesterday, right? So, so I didn't understand this before. So spend some time looking at it. And this is what I've concluded is that this is just a way of telling you this is on the day of Pentecost. Okay. And he's going to bring the Pentecost offering to his wife. Right. The, uh, the kid of the goats. So the significance of that in tying it together with our line is is what? what? What did we sort of discuss yesterday? Uh, because of that, we were able to place the place it in where, well, where we have it right now, where you have it. Yeah, so explain it. Well, uh, the 49 days that are between the first fruits, which is um, what we, discer we discerned as uh, December 25th, right? Mm -hmm. um, 49 days later, Adelio makes a presentation. The first one was um, from Collins, and we, de we decided that those were the wave offering loaves. Right. I mean, the, lo the loaves. That yeah. were made from the offerings, right? Yeah. So we were able to see that. 
Um, and then you just position these other ones down the strain a little bit because uh, we didn't we hadn't decided exactly where they were going to go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. So we just have those things off to the side. So we can see then that the two loaves is the the first fruits offering on Pentecost. And and so these re refer to basically these two presentations. Right, right, which we decided that was communicate or was communicating out the twenty five twenty, or I mean, or the the charts. That's right, the how charts. we determined that. Yeah, so I mean, to me, this is is pretty interesting, mm. right? I, especially considering what I just studied, right? So just on the day that I put out this paper, uh, published the paper on academia, um. I, you know, which I pu published before the study began. And then we had the study and I recognized that I had missed this one verse. I didn't write about it the self same day in reference to Pentecost. Um, so this, this becomes really important, right? So, so this self same day, this anniversary date, this bone date uh, points to Pentecost, of course, being the sixth day of the third month. Um, but now we're, we're understanding this just as we're studying this in our, in our regular studies, right? Fascinating. Yeah. Okay. So at this point, the comment that you're making is that Samson brings the kid of a goat to his wife, since that was to have been an offering mm -hmm. at the time of the Feast of Weeks. Mm -hmm. I find it interesting that the admonition that Moses gives on this, that we find in Numbers 2830. Yeah, so this is, yeah, so we, i got to go there now, Numbers... 28 verse 30 to make atonement. So um, a several tenth deal unto one lamb through the seven lambs, throughout the seven lambs, and one kid of the goats to make atonement and atonement for you. So <clears throat> the application is being made that this is Samson atoning for something with his wife right that's what we would have to say so what we i mean the wife of course represents a church in the symbolic sense yes now we're not saying in the context and the application that we're making that's not referring to the seventh day adventist church as an organization what do you mean atoning Atoning, like making atonement for your sin. It's a sin, sin offering. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so the only thing that Samson had done that was an issue with his wife is presenting this riddle and having not told her the riddle in advance. Yeah, so he didn't, yeah, so, so he didn't tell his wife the riddle. <laughs> I'm intrigued yeah. with the, the balance of your application in the light of Deuteronomy 16.9. Yeah, so Deuteronomy, yeah, so Deuteronomy 16.9 and 10, that's going to be dealing with the Feast of Weeks. Right? Because at 16.9, we have seven weeks shalt thou number unto thee. Begin to number the seven weeks from such time as thou beginnest to put the sickle to the corn. Right, so that's going to be um, connected with December 25th, 2021, right? That's where we started counting these 49 days. Well, okay, we, we have that application, but I'm, I'm looking at this as well because the since I don't understand Hebrew and I don't read it, mm -hmm. I'm looking at this in the English to try to understand that we have this count, this chronology mm -hmm. that is expected. 
Right. So one of the things that I, I note in my paper, like, why do we count the Feast of Weeks? I mean, why didn't <clears throat> why didn't Moses or God just give, you know, you're going to have the wave sheaf offering on the 16th day of the first month, and you're going to have Pentecost on the, the sixth day of the third month. Just tell us, give us those dates like he does with the other ones. But he wants us to count to these seven weeks. And we can see that reflected in the 70 week prophecy itself. Right? I mean, you're going to have to count the 70 weeks. You know, they're going to break it up, you know, seven weeks, three score and two weeks. And then you're going to have this final week. You know, we're told to count it. We're not, we're not just given, you know, 490 years. I mean, I always think it's funny when people say there's no, 25, 20 years mentioned in the Bible anywhere. I say, well, there's no 490 years mentioned in the Bible anywhere. Like you get a prophecy of 70 weeks. You don't have them say 490 years. You have to understand it as a symbol and then figure where, how that symbol applies. But so, you know, in counting these weeks, God is doing this typically because in order to understand the prophecy related to Christ and because that, that's going to be fulfilled Pentecost is going to be fulfilled in the time of Christ right if you take it as a prophecy it's going to be a, in Acts chapter 2 and that's in connection with the 70th week right that's going to be Christ beginning his work in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary so all of these things that have happened in the Old Testament we've we've missed the significance of the counting of Pentecost as a prophetic symbol. But we also have this application to our movement at this time as well, uh, because this has to do with this chronology, right? Correct. Yeah. <clears throat> now, in, in the numbers uh, where it talks about this, right? So we had... Uh, um, where it also talks about this um, offering, right? So you got these these different different offerings, and they're going to have these um, three tenth deals unto one bullock, two tenth deals unto one ram, a several tenth deal unto one lamb. That just means a single tenth, one tenth uh, throughout the seven lambs. So, um, so you're going to have seven lambs, and each of them are going to get one tenth of a deal, right? Um, which is kind of a, a strange. I mean, we 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 don't know what that means in English, right? So, just to understand what this means, I don't know if they're going to give us anything about these tenth deals. Um, I mean, if you look at the the, the words that are here, um, a tenth part, right, uh, a fraction, right? So this one here, when it translates it as several tenth deal, it actually just puts the word twice. You see that there? So in, in this one, uh, where it gets three tenths deal, you're going to have Shalosh, which means three, three tenths deal. And then this one's going to say two tenths deal. It's going to Shanaim uh, tenths deal. So that's going to be two tenths. And then you're going to have this several tenths, but it just puts tenth tenth, which is kind of a weird way of doing it. It doesn't say one tenth, it just puts it as a doubling. So there, so there, yeah. there again, the application would be that this offering would be something tied back with the, the second angel's message. Uh, well, yes, but it's also seven lambs, right? Right. So seven, you seven. You got two young bullets, one ram, seven lambs of the first year. So the bullock, uh, they're going to put three-tenths deals onto one bullock. So that's going to be six-tenths 
right? Because there's two right. million cards. And then two tenths deals with one RAM. So that's going to be eight. Um, and then you're going to have this several tenths deal onto one lamb seven times, right? So I guess altogether that's 15, 15 tenths. So now as far as a deal, like they're not tell telling you what that is um, because they're, they're putting that. So they put it. So you're dealing out. My idea is that, that, that this is just you're dividing this out. That's why they use the word deal. It's not referring to a unit of measure. Um, but this this would be some basis of some measure that they're using, which I'm not sure what it is. Um, so I'd have to look that up a bit more. But but the point is we have these tenths and we know tenth represents a remnant. But we have all these different offerings uh, connected to the Feast of Weeks. Right. And then you have one kid of the goats to make an atonement for you. Right. So it doesn't talk about any um, um, adding any of this, um, this flour mingled with oil, right? Doesn't tell you that this is going to happen with one a kid of the goats. But also you can see in this, isn't this sort of typical of what you see with the Day of Atonement? The type of offerings that are here in connection with Pentecost. It's providing a very similar symbolism, yes. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so the Day of Atonement, of course, happens in the fall feasts. But here you can see that this is, is pre-echoed in, in the spring types. Right. In the Day of Atonement, you're going to have two goats, you know, one for the Lord and one for Azazel, the scapegoat. But here you're going to have one kid of the goats to make atonement for you. And ye shall offer them beside the continual burnt offerings and his meat offerings. So you're not going to stop serving those. Uh, and the drink offerings, those are still going to be served. But um, you're going to have then these, these specific offerings. And, and that's what Samson's going to offer is this one kid of the goats to make atonement for you. Right? That's going to be the offering there. Right? Yeah. Okay. So... Uh, and then when we looked at this in, because we looked at it in Leviticus 23, verse 21. And uh, <clears throat> so in that one, you're going to have this same idea being presented. But it's also going to mention the two wave loaves of two tenth deals. Right. So this this is telling you how what you know the recipe for making these loaves. Uh, I don't know how much much it is, but it's good they're gonna be made um of fine flour and they shall be baken with leaven. They are the first fruits unto the Lord. So you have these two wave loaves with two tenths deals. Right. So I don't know if each each loaf has two tenths deals. I would assume that's what it is. But each one is of two tenths deals of, fl of fine flour. Right. And then it mentions ye shall offer with the bread the seven lambs without blemish of the first year, the one young bullock and two rams, and they shall be for a burnt offering unto the Lord with their meat offering and the drink offerings, even an offering made by fire of sweet savor unto the Lord. So here they, they don't mention the the flour and the oil uh, with these offerings, but it's mentioned other places. And this is, of course, is in Leviticus 23, which is given, um, well, we're not sure exactly when Leviticus was written, but my view is that it was written uh, at the time that they get the law the second time. It's definitely not something written later on, like Deuteronomy would be. Right, that's going to be written at the end of their wilderness sojournings. This would have been uh, at the beginning of their wilderness sojournings, right? That's how we would understand where when Leviticus was written. Yeah, that's I how I understood it. Because, it actually does give you the date. I think it's the first day of the first month or something on the second year. Okay, at the beginning of Leviticus? Somewhere right there, yes. Okay, um, well, let me see. 
Uh, oops, that didn't work. See if I find that in Leviticus. Um, Or maybe it's that. Uh, I don't think it tells maybe, us, but what's well, that? Well, maybe I, I'm thinking in Exodus 40, verse 17, I'm thinking of, and then that's just like a continuation. So I'm not. Okay, so you're saying in Exodus, um, it came to pass in the first month of the second year, on the first day of the month, the tabernacle was reared up? Yeah. So okay. I think. I think it's sort of between there and the 20th day of the second month. Because you get that in Numbers chapter 10. So that's when they leave to go to the promised land. Right. Yeah, it came to pass on the 20th, 20th day of the second month in the second year that the cloud was taken up off from the tabernacle of the testimony. Right. Yeah, so, so the, the history same. of Le Leviticus, yeah, you, you've got, you actually got like a 50 day period there for, okay. that, uh, for Leviticus to be wrote. Yeah, because you're going from the first day of the first month in the second year to the 20th day of the second month in the second year. And that, that's a 50 day period. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and um, so it's in that time that the book of Leviticus is written, is what you're saying? Yes. Okay. Right, so that's my, that's my understanding, too. It's written at the beginning there. And um, so, um, so this Feast of Weeks being mentioned here, this is, you know, this is, there, and that's why they're going to talk about when you come into the land, um, that... You know, it's going to be on the morrow after the Sabbath that you're going to give your offerings, right? So now when they come into the land, they came, come in the 10th day of the first month, right? So the idea there is that the first Sabbath that they have, the morrow after that Sabbath, they're going to give their wave offering. But that's that's not really established what day of the week or what um, what day of the of the month that's going to be ahead of time, right? So so this is you know the second year after they've they've left Egypt. Well, it's not going to be fulfilled until another thirty nine years later, right? Correct. Okay. Now. But they could have gone into the promised land sooner. Correct? Well, yeah, but they, they were plagued with unbelief. Right. But since they didn't go in sooner, this would have changed which calendar date. I mean, this is sort of speculation, but obviously if they had gone in in the second year, Right. If they had uh, fulfilled that, there the, it, it would have been different, right? The, it would have been on a different day of the week, or different. You know, it would have been on still on the Sabbath after they cross the Jordan. The morrow after they cross the Jordan, they're going to offer this wave offering. But this just happens to be because forty years later, God foresees this, right? That this is going to happen, and it's going to fall on the sixteenth day of the first month. Right, you understand what I'm saying? So it's not predetermined here when they're like for the Israelites when they're when this is going to be. They don't know what day of the month this is going to happen on, right? They just know when they cross into the land that, that this is going to happen. Right? So they they I guess they know what time of the year they're going to end up going into the promised land, right? But when it because it's going to be talking about the feast of the Lord, the Passover, the feast of first fruits. And so the Feast of first fruits with the wave offering, this is going to happen the morrow after the Sabbath, right? Once you get into the land, it says in verse 10, speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, 
when ye be come into the land which I give you, and shall reap the harvest thereof. So this is going to be in the spring, right? Then ye shall bring a sheaf of first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. So they know that when they get into the land the first time, and they're going to have this harvest, that on the morrow after the Sabbath, that's when they're going to wave this wave offering. But they don't know what day of the month that's going to be yet. But they are told that that's going to happen on the self-same day. That is, when they, they do this, um, this is going to be on the self-same day. Ye shall eat neither bread nor parched corn nor green ears until the self-same day that ye have brought an offering unto your God. So this self-same day is the bone day. So it says, once you do this the first time, you're going to do it on the morrow after Sabbath. But from then on, you're going to do it on that same calendar date from ever after, right? Does that make sense to people? Yes, it makes sense to me. And the same, mm -hmm. is, and the, yeah, and the same thing is with the Feast of Weeks. So when they get to Pentecost, it's going to be on the same calendar date from then on. But the first time they're going to do it is going to be the morrow after the seventh Sabbath. So to, to me, this is just very remarkable. I mean, you know, I've written a paper on it already, but just the light that's coming from this, especially in connection with what we're studying. Specifically <laughs> what we're studying. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if I've taken it all in yet. I don't know if I understand it all of what's being said. Um, but we can see that what Samson is doing is on the day of Pentecost, he's going to his wife with this offering, which is in accordance with the day of Pentecost. Right? Right. So, I mean... Because this is now in the time of wheat harvest. Now, you know, we just read that. We say, well, that could be any, any of the time of wheat harvest, but not based upon what is said before. Right? Because what is said before is, and it, it came to be from the day, in the day of the harvest of wheat. Right? or in the days of the harvest of wheat, but it's from the day in the days. So this is the counting of the days to Pentecost. So it has to be at the at Pentecost that he does this. And for us to then understand how this relates to our lines, I mean, we can see quite clearly that this 49 days between, and, and we had marked this 49 days long before we made this application, right? We noticed this 49 days when we first uh, studied this, right? Yes, and that was a so, year ago. Well, not quite a year ago that we first noticed the 49 days, but it was when we, we studied uh, this before. I mean, we probably noted the 49 years, 49 days uh, some time ago before we had studied Samson, but the first time we went through Samson, we noted this, I believe. I don't think this was a new revelation. We, I know we studied it before, right? So we have these 49 days there, but now we're connecting it to specifically to Judges 15, and we, we putting these 49 days in line, and we can see their significant significance with the first fruits and Pentecost. And so, so we're counting these seven weeks here now. We're looking back at this, and we can see that these exist. So, I mean, the implications, there's lots of implications uh, to this, not just in this study, but in other ways. But we have this bone day or this anniversary date, right? So, so what does that 
the fact that something happens in the self same day, that means it's going to be repeated, right? Correct. Right. So, because we have these anniversaries and we could see in our lines, you know, we have these anniversaries, right? We're gonna start, um, you know, the study, the study that we're in uh, on December 26th. So the day after Colin's study, um, but it's going to have this anniversary uh, dealing with um, the fact that we did number 252 in those studies on December 26, 2022. So, um, so we started the day after and we had this 252 study, but, but there's these anniversaries, these two 20, December 25th as well, not just the 26th. And we could see December 25th is the 20th day of the ninth month. Um, and that was the end of our, our structure, but we had the first day of the 10th month being the beginning of this uh, commencement of this divorce proceedings, right, from the strange wives. And that was December 25th, 2022. And so in, you know, <laughs> to put this all together, I mean, I, I don't know if I've, I've got it all together in my mind yet. Sorry about that, that I, that I don't, because it'd be nice if I did, you know, we could, we could just, but you can see what the process that we're going through here. So, so then we have the wife, right? So he wants to go into his wife, but the father is, would not suffer him to go in. So what is this referring to in our history? Who's the father? I'm not sure if we ever decided who that father was. Okay, well. We, we represent talk, God himself. What's that, Jeff? You represent God himself? No. I don't, so. So. I don't think so. But. God's directing, directing us, you know. Yeah. Well, it could be. I mean, maybe it's God um, having, having some process that we have to go through, that God, in a sense, is restricting this access of, of this. So, well, her father said, I verily thought that thou hadst utterly hated her. Therefore, I gave her to thy companion. Is not her younger sister fairer than thee? Take her, I pray thee, instead of her. Now, uh, you know, we're taking that the younger sister, at least I am, that the younger sister refers to the Omega. So I, I can't picture God telling us that, like in a sort of a direct moral sense. Though we could see that the father represents this providential uh, event. So the God is is allowing these things to occur to give us a choice. I mean, so that is a possibility. Um, but the father could, what, okay, what's that? Uh, My question goes back to 15.1. Yeah. Is this offering that is being brought, are we considering this in the literal, spiritual, or ironic sense? But we're not taking it ironically because it's not something immoral at least at least that's the way I would look at it I would say that this is is just marking this message right so this message of Samson which is this message of July 18th in connection with chronology it's connecting it to because we just have the one offering here it's not going to bring two you know two loaves of bread He's not going to bring, uh, you know, a ram and a bullock, right, or, and and seven lambs, right? He's just going to take this kid of the goats, right? But it's symbolically representing all of that. But he's looking to be atoned for an action against a Philistine. Yes. 
but uh, that's why I'm having trouble with it. Okay, so yeah, so you're trying to put too, too much. You're trying to take. See, what I'm doing is I'm separating these symbols from the narrative in a sense, right? All right. Okay. So you know we don't need we don't need to sort of match up this with the other story and and try to figure out exactly what he's toning toning himself for. We just know it's atonement, right? This is a work of of understanding righteousness by faith, right? It it represents that part of that message, the message of atonement, right? So this is not just a prophetic message. It's also a message about the law, right? We have the law and the prophets here, right? So, so we can see that, that, this, that this chronology is tied up with our salvational issues. That, that's kind of what I presented yesterday in presenting the lines. I don't know if you saw that, Dwight, because you weren't there, but if you watched the video, uh, you know, the simple presentations of the lines that I did yesterday afternoon, I was, I was trying to show that these lines are really about salvation. It's the everlasting gospel. It's not just about events that are that happen in Millerite history or events that are going to happen in our history. It's about an experience that we go through as we pass through these events. And so that's what I would see is represented here with Samson visiting his wife with a kid, this kid of the goats. It brings us to this symbol of Pentecost, the offerings in Pentecost, and show that this, this salvational aspect of this message, that it's connected to the gospel. Well, the reason I'm having an issue with this When, when we were going through part of this over the last several weeks, mm -hmm. there is there is a, a point that Mrs. White makes very, very clearly. In Signs of the Times, October 6th, 1881, She makes, she, she makes the following statement. The Lord has, in his word, plainly instructed his people not to unite themselves with those who have not his love and fear before them. Such companions will seldom be satisfied with the love and respect which are justly theirs. They will constantly seek to gain from the God-fearing wife or husband some favor which shall involve a disregard of the divine requirements to a godly man and to the church with which he is connected. A worldly wife or a worldly friend is as a spy in the camp which will watch every opportunity to betray the servant of Christ and expose him to the enemy's attacks. Now we're going to see that much clearer as we go further into the story of Samson. But here in 15.1, Samson has sought an alliance that he was not to have entered into. He is now bringing this offering, this atonement, to those that he should not have been atoned with. Right. So just ignore that part. You, you have to separate that out. So you have this ironic story. We know that this is all an immoral story, right? I'm not disagreeing with that. So just ignore that part because we're not we're not looking at this in trying to to make that direct moral application right so so we're just taking this as the symbols that are being presented we know like christ is symbolized here well christ doesn't do that but he does you know it's the gospel to the gentiles right I mean, he does give a message that is going to be given to the gentiles you know the everlasting gospel is meant to be given to the world not just for the Jews. That was the purpose the Jews were chosen. So Samson here in this story, we, we, if we just read the narrative, you know, it's 
It's not good. But we're looking at the symbols and we're, we're applying them in their positive sense, not in their negative sense. So when he offers this kid of the goats, this is an offering that is for atonement. And, and this represents the gospel. This represents the work of atonement, the work that we are going through. Um, in, in understanding these truths. And, and Samson is going to, to offer this offering. So this is something that's being offered to this movement. But he's going to be hindered from doing that. Has Samson been hindered over the past year in giving this, this message? I would say without a doubt. So, so that's what, that's how I'm understanding this story. I'm going back to Colin's presentation and then Odilia's. And, and this message has been withheld from the movement for the last year. Now, you know, when I talked to Colin about it, right, you know, what I decision I'd made about not really participating, you know, he said that I made a mistake, that what I did was wrong. Now, I don't believe it was. I believe it was in God's providence. And so when I look at the father here, I don't, I mean, you could maybe apply it to God in some sense, but as far as in the practical sense, this just has to do with the movement itself, the aspect of the movement that is the civil power of the movement. That this That's message, what I was thinking, actually. This message was pushed out uh, during that time. And, and during that time when we made that first invitation, December 25th, and God led in what was revealed there by Colin and also what Stephen had found, and then Odilio's presentation 49 days later, the 50th day technically, um, you know, we now had this, uh, you know, this... Everything was, was shut up. I mean, basically, we weren't, they weren't receiving a message from, from this movement, from, from the, what God was showing this movement. So we were studying all through this period of time, and the movement isn't aware of what we're studying, right? Correct. Yeah. So, so now we have here, at the end of this year, we have the self-same day this anniversary occurring and we end up in connection with this anniversary uh, once again, giving this offering, right? Presenting it again, this time we're allowed to come in at this point, if that makes sense. Uh, yes. And uh, I, I noticed that when we were going through uh, the study, um, how there wasn't the knee-jerk reactions to you that there were before. I mean, it, it completely had gone away. Yeah. So, you know, maybe I mean, there was a couple places there that I was waiting. You know, I, I started getting anxieties actually from where the direction it was going and, but nothing. Uh, yeah. Now, you know, if you remember my, my apology there at the beginning, and I said, you know, absence makes, you know, there's the saying absence makes the heart grow fonder. Um, but you know, yeah. <laughs> absence can also allow the imagination. And, and I apologize, you know, for the way that my thoughts towards others had, had because those are the, thing, those are the things I have control over, not, not other people's imaginations. So I apologize for my own imaginations about what other people might be thinking or whatever. And, and that's a sincere apology because it comes from something I recognized, right? Um, because of talking to Colin. But I also think it was in God's providence, that separation from the movement for me personally. Um, because I don't think if I had continued uh, for that whole year, interfering in their studies, giving my opinion about everything, that... Um, things would have gone, things would have gotten worse, I think. 
Well, you said it before, bro. Uh, this is one of those God providence things. I mean, it, it worked out the way it did because, you know, he's got control of them wheels. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and we can see this here in, in what we're understanding about the self same day, what we're understanding about Pentecost, what we're understanding about um, these anniversaries. I mean, because these anniversaries have shown up again and again on the lines and I never understood why. But this is a bone day, right? So God has these anniversaries. Um, you know, we can see that anniversary with the July 18th, right, where we have this um, understanding about July 18th and uh, the number of days, 161 days, etc., cetera, uh, going to uh, December 25th. 2021 so the things that god had been showing us all along the way have had these these it's in god's providence just like when they're going to come out of the out of the wilderness and they go into the promised land god has set up something that they have to count from the first day after the sabbath to get to pentecost and, and it's going to set up this calendar that then's going to be then is going to be followed for the rest of you know history, right? It's going to we're going to have the 16th day of the first month is going to be the wave sheaf, and the sixth of Savan is going to be Pentecost. That's the way God set it up, but He sets it up so that we have to count, we have to understand chronology, we have to know right. the first clue. One of the first clues there, I mean, yeah, that we really recognize anyway. And then it's applied to the 70 week prophecy. So it becomes Pentecost becomes a type of the 70 weeks. But it's, you know, it's good, of course going to be years for days and they're going to have the first seven weeks at the beginning, then 62 weeks and then the final week. Right. And, and when I first started studying this, the, like the, the 2520 and all these prophetic lines and all the symbolism back in 2014, you know, I did a diagram where I, I understood that there was this symbolism between the 70 weeks and the spring types and between the fall types and 2300 days and how it was connected to the spring types. Um, so let me see if I'll find this here again. I've showed it before. Um, so here it is. So this is my, my rough understanding of things back in 2014. So I got this, the two weeks at the beginning here. Um, you know, up to, to Pentecost, right? You got the lamb, you got the one week, and then the six weeks. So this is seven weeks. So you can see the, this one week, the six weeks, the seven weeks, going up to, to sixth of Savan, the 50th day, right? And these are the spring types. So we can see that this is related in sort of a reverse order because you're going to have the six weeks or the 62 weeks or whatever so this would be um well not reverse so this is the one week this is the 62 weeks and this is the seven weeks can, can we see that that this the seven weeks represents the 70 weeks is it plain to people what i'm saying that the seven weeks represent the what he said 70 weeks 70 weeks, okay. Right. See how they're divided up? The first, the one week, then the six weeks, then the one day? Yeah. Yep. Okay. We can see the 70 weeks are set up as seven weeks, 62 weeks, and one week. All right. It parallels it, yes. Okay, right. So, so we can see that parallel with the spring types. And then in the fall types... Um, we can see that it's going to connect back to the spring types. So you're going to have six months for the, you know, from the spring types to the seventh month. 
and and then this is going to relate to um, the 25, 2300 days and the 2520. So <clears throat> it's too much to explain here. I don't want to get too confusing here, but but you can see that this is the fall types and that they're connected to the spring types in the sense that the seventh month is the counting of the seventh month from the first month, right? I mean, it's, it's a pretty simple idea that this is about a week, right? Right, right. <laughs> because in the biblical understanding, you have a week, that's seven days. The, the feasts occur in a period of seven months. And then you have the sabbatical cycle of seven years. You have the jubilee cycle of seven times seven years. And then you have the history of the world, seven periods of 7,000 years, right? Right. So, so you have this, if you want to call it maybe fractalization, right? Because you zoom in to that, to that week, and in that week is typified the whole history of the world, right? Especially the creation week. It shows that whole history of the world. But you can also zoom into that uh, where you get the individual, right? I mean, the individual experience is illustrated in the creation of the world. You know, darkness to light, to being recreated into God's image, right? The restoration of the image of God in man. That's the gospel. So, so these things, you know, that I saw back in 2014, I mean, we can now see them much more clearly in our lines. Um that to me is quite an amazing, um, quite an amazing thing to see. It, it, it sort of reminds me a little bit of when, when Jeff saw all of the sort of fruit of his labors pointing to July 18th, right? So he could say that July 18th, this prediction ties to everything that God ever showed him, right? All of his years of study came to that point. That's why Jeff knew it was from God. And, and this is what I see happening is that, that all of that we have studied, not just in the last uh, every, you know, nine years or whatever, 10 years. I mean, for me personally, I mean, but even all of the things that I've studied ever since I've become an Adventist or even from my conversion um, and even before what God was trying to show me. I mean, these all come together in understanding these things. There's just so many different threads that are woven in this tapestry um, that is this prophecy, right? These threads are individual thread, threads, the threads of the church, the threads of the movement. Um, and they all come together in this way. In, in God's time, in his providence, right? not ahead of time and not late, even though sometimes we might think it is, but we, we see God's hand in all of these things. Um, so Dwight, any other thoughts on that, what you were struggling with? Just a lot of things I have to consider. Okay. Yeah, So so we can see in this, the father sort of restricting this. I mean, I, I don't know fully how to understand this, but I do see in the younger sister, the Omega, something else that is being offered. So maybe we could see this as God's hands, God's providence, that he's giving us a choice. And, and in the chat there, it was a Deuteronomy uh, 30. Um. <clears throat> Uh, verse 19 and 20, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live, that thou mayest love the Lord thy God and that thou mayest obey his voice and that thou mayest cleave unto him. For he is thy life and the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob to give them. Um, so this is, of course, is the blessings and the curses, right? That that we see here recorded. 
his choice of life and death. And, and so God in his providence is always presenting that choice to us. Right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Isn't the third angel's message in detail a a distilled version of Leviticus 26? Well, yes. But but it would be I mean not just the third angel's message but all three messages. Right. That's when I'm when I'm looking at this as a distilled version. We know that if they're not bene if people are not benefited by the first two messages, they won't be benefited by the third. Mm -hmm. The third angel's message is very much a a very concentrated statement of Leviticus 26 because you have a choice just like what's being presented in that with Deuteronomy 30. Mm -hmm. You're being given the choice of either a blessing or a curse. And that's, that's really what the whole, the whole crux of the matter is with the 2520, because the church long ago rejected the blessings and they don't want it to be reminded of this. The Omega doesn't want to be reminded of the blessings. They're making the choice that these can be set aside and that we have then to accept their word, which leads us directly to the curse. Okay, say that, say that again. That We have a situation. Yeah. Just like with the Omega, they, they want to set aside the blessings. And who's the they? I said just like the Omega. Okay. The so Omega wishes to set aside the blessings. Yeah. They, the Omega, want others to accept their word. So they, the Omega, are basically making the offer of the curses. But they're trying to make the curses a, a good thing, a palatable thing. Okay, so, I mean, we know that the Omega, um, yeah, they're taking the the wrong side of the moral issue, painting it as morality. Um, but but that's been offered to this movement. So so when we look at that being offered, so I always look at well, that's November ninth, right? Right. Yeah, so that's where we, we have the choice here. But now we can see that this is more directly in our history. That this is occurring at Pentecost. Right? It basically in this history with Collins and Odilio's study. Can can we see that? That the, uh, the younger sister is being offered. That is, that is death that's being offered. Correct? Agreeable. Okay. Agreed. I said before you life and death. I, I thought you'd chosen death. Isn't that what the father is saying? Now, of course, in the story, you know, the wife is a Philistine, but that's that that that's not doesn't matter. We just know that it's it's got this ironic we're using story. the symbol. We're just using a yeah. symbol. That's all. 
is using the symbol. So the younger sister is going to represent the omega. The wife is going to represent the truth in this case, right? It's not going to represent something bad. It's the church. And Christ, here Samson, I mean, it's Christ. So this is the message of Christ. Um, you know, he's going to make this offering for atonement. Right. But but we're talking about our history. We're not talking about some bigger scheme of things, even though we can apply the story of Samson to these bigger things. We're looking at at our history. And, and you could go back to the you know, if you wanted to, we could go back to the Pentecost of Acts chapter two. So so if we did that, can we say that that was what was happening in Acts chapter two? That Christ was going to. The church, so to speak, right? That would be Israel. And the Father is setting before them life and death. Can can we see the parallel there with the Pentecost in Acts chapter 2? Very much. Okay. Yes, I have to agree. But we see it here in our history. And, and this is all of this light that is being poured out upon this movement. I mean, we have to recognize that this is the Holy Spirit. I mean, this is not man's doing. Everything that we have discovered, everything, you know, Stephen presented in his uh, study on Sabbath. I mean, this wasn't this wasn't because, you know, Stephen is smart or I'm smart or whatever. Right. That we somehow imagined these things, you know, with our intellect. We sort of created something out of nothing. Um, right. This is just God unfolding his truth to those that are digging for truth. That's the way I see it. Yeah. You know, God is revealing these things to us, those who don't deserve it, because God Have is you been actually God. thinking about that? I mean, <laughs> I, I can't even imagine me being associated with this. Well, you know, I mean, if I was to look at me and, you know, go and uh, pick him, no, don't, let's not pick him. Let's look over here. <laughs> Yeah, and, and all of us should be able to see that, that we are the farthest things from who we would, you know, in, in an objective sense, choose that, you know, that we think God would choose to do this work. Right. We have all of our defects. We have all of our sin. We have. Now, we can also see how God has led. So on the one hand, we can we can look at, at our our sin we can look at what we are, but we can also see how the experiences that we have gone through have all been in God's providence in our past. Even the bad things, which which I find hard to take sometimes. You know, the mistakes that we made, the, the decisions that we made that weren't, you know, God-led in that sense. God still used those things in his his providence to speak to us to teach us so that we could be here at this moment and that to me is an amazing thing about god it's like um i'm just going to read this to you i won't show it on the screen here but um so one of the guys who was commenting on my um my book, so, you know, or not book, but paper that I put out here. I'm just going to go to these notifications. Your latest one here, the wave sheet. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so the the latest one here that I put up, so a guy commented it. Let me see if I can find his comment. Uh, so many uh, notifications, okay. Now, this is a guy, um, I, I'm friends with him on Facebook, a um, guy named Doug Mason. Um, and, you know, so I, I, I put this paper and I put out an invitation, you know, uh, 1,782 uh, invitations um, based 
based upon you know people who are friends with me and, and people who have these interests in the categories I chose. So you know I've had like five or six people respond so far. But <clears throat> anyway, Doug Mason, his response, here's what he says. So this is how many people think. Uh, the book of Leviticus was the product of priests exiled by the 6th century BCE Babylonians. Their objective was to install the Levitical priesthood and control the Persian era society of Yehud. To achieve this, they proposed religious observances, and to do that, they claimed that these new laws had actually been given at the formation of the peoples. If I were in the 6th century BCE audience receiving these religious observances, I would have been put in my place if I asked the Levites why they were talking about things that would take place 2,500 years in the future. What would be the point? Of course, they failed, and laws such as the Sabbath were not known until the time of the Hasmoneans. So here's a person who's saying that what was written in the Bible aforetime was not written for our learning. Right. So, I mean, he's obviously denying the New Testament scriptures. You know. That's what it sounds like. But isn't this what people really believe? Isn't this what Seventh-day Adventists believe for the most part? Yeah, they they try to take God out of everything, it seems like. To me, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> we're supposed to have faith that he's the one that's working these wheels and he's the one that's got the thing we're just supposed to be trying to figure out what it's all about <laughs> well yeah i mean for many adventists god isn't really in their every day-to-day -day life i tend to agree with that you know that god is something you know you 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 might have some some devotionals and i think most adventists don't um but, you know, you're going to go to church on Sabbath and you're going to think about God a little bit. Maybe not even at all. Sometimes. Um, you know, he's not a big part of your life. You're not praying to him about the little things every day. I mean, if you lose your keys, you're not going to kneel down and pray and ask God to find your keys. Right. I mean, people just don't do that very often. People don't think about everything that's happening. Uh, but here in this movement, we, we must recognize God's providences, God's leading. You know, uh, without a doubt. Another thing, another thing I note in my paper, um, you know, I suggest people read the paper because there's lots of different things in there that, you know, we, we've touched on, but I've never really given the evidences for it. But I clearly show that. The correct day of atonement in 1844, if you use Jerusalem, is October 23rd, not October 22nd. But the Millerites, in God's providence, determined the day of atonement based upon Boston. Right, I noticed that. Right. So, you know, because if they had looked at the new moon, and, and see, they were... They were sort of using a mixture of, of the Karite calendar and the biblical calendar and the rabbinic calendar. They, they didn't understand the Karite calendar. But they looked at the new moon in Boston because they were observing the moon each month, right? So they wanted to establish that October 22nd was going to be the 10th day of the seventh month. And if you looked in... So that means the 13th, October 13th, would have been the first day of the seventh month, right? Okay. So you would need to see the new moon of that seventh month. You'd need to see it on October 12th, the evening of October 12th. And that does occur in Boston, but it's not seen in Jerusalem till the evening of the 13th. Right, so if they were using the Karaite calendar, the calendar, the Karaite calendar would produce an October twenty third date based on Jerusalem uh, for the Day of Atonement. But remember, Hiram Etzin sees Christ moving from the Holy to the Most Holy Place on October twenty third, which is in the afternoon of October twenty third in Jerusalem. So, so based on Jerusalem. Christ actually moves from the holy to the most holy on the 23rd of October, right? Okay. 
And Hiram Etzen sees him doing this. So what happened in heaven happened in accordance with Jerusalem. But the Israel or the Israelites, uh, the Millerites, they were observing October 22nd. And that's in God's providence. Because if they had observed the 23rd, would Hiram Edson had seen, gone out after the disappointment and seen Christ moving from the holy to the most holy? Probably not. No, he wouldn't have, okay. Um, but also, we know that there is this fulfillment of prophecy. Now, imagine that God has this prophecy about what's going to happen at the end of the 2300 years. If the Millerites had chose some other date, let's say they had chose September 23rd as the Day of Atonement. They just followed the rabbinic calendar. I mean, they didn't, and gifts are big things. But, you know, if this was the case, um, do you think that God would not have honored that as the Day of Atonement? Because you would need the fulfillment of prophecy, right? Somebody... You know, I mean, if it was some other date and, and God is going to have a people either at that date or he's going to honor the date that the people choose. Right. Based upon their knowledge. So, I, you know, God honors October 22nd. That's the date they chose. It's the local, the correct local date for the Day of Atonement. And there's no really indication in Scripture that God expects anything other than than a local observance of the feasts, right? I mean, they always tried to do it to Jerusalem, but based on what? I mean, Ezekiel, he's going to observe the, the Babylonian calendar when he's in captivity, you know? Well, sir, uh, in the beginning, when he created the heavens and the earth, he didn't he create the seasons and all them, all those things to correspond uh with the with the celestial cycle, right? Right, but that's going to be different from different places on the earth, right? So if, Correct. If you were a Jew in North America and you had no contact with Jews in Jerusalem and you didn't know anything about, you know, an ephemeris, right? You couldn't go online and, you know, because you were somehow, you know, cut off. I mean, you would have observed the feasts, right? Let's say, you know, when if you were a Jew in... North America, you know, 400 years ago, I mean, all you would have, you know, is what you observe locally. I mean, if you were going to uh, observe the calendar, of course, they would have just used the rabbinic calendar. But if you were observing things, all you would have is what you see. You would know when the feasts are. So the Millerites, they only know what they can see locally. They don't have access really to Jerusalem especially like the final month, it would take longer than that to, to get word from Jerusalem regarding whether the new moon was seen or not. Right. Right. And go on right. That out. But yet, you know, God, God in his providence, he has October 22nd chosen by the Millerites. And, and we need to acknowledge this as Adventists. Adventists have not ever addressed this point that I know of in any sort of official way. Why Hiram Edson is seeing Christ moving from the holy to the most holy on the 23rd and not on the 22nd. Just another thing that was uh, observational. So I know we, we went, somebody over, picked up on it. Yeah. So we went over time here, but you can see that this is in God's providence that we are seeing these things here at this time. And that, that we are applying these things locally and literally to us in, in the very literal sense as individuals, as a movement, that God's hand is directing these things, just as he did with the Millerites, just as he directed people in the past. And when somebody can't see that, when all they can see is, well, this was just about something way back then. I mean, this person's just speaking completely from a lack of understanding of the Bible. Because if he had spent the time to actually read my paper, I mean, and think about it, he would be absolutely, utterly amazed at what was found, right? But he's just going to dismiss it all because he has a belief that the Levites wrote 
the Bible and that it never even stuck, you know, that people didn't actually start keeping the Sabbath until the time of the Hasmoneans. Right. Yeah, it's, it's more about chance than than planning. Yeah, so he thinks the Sabbath was not observed by the Jews un, you know, until the second century BC. I mean, it's just ridiculous. I mean, you can't study Ezekiel's chronology and believe that this is something that was, uh, you know, the book of Ezekiel, and it's just something that was, you know, manufactured way later. So, so anyway, we're going to close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study and for the time that we have had here this morning. May you bless us throughout this day until we come together again. Help us in our personal study and our walk with you, with the challenges of each day, with the opportunities that we have to witness to others. And um, for the light that you are showing us, the conviction that you bring upon our hearts, may it truly change us. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.